Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming here today. Uh, and a special thanks to GTCom for co-hosting this landmark event. My name is Keith Augustin. I'm the managing director with Burl on the alternative data team, uh, focused on helping investors find uh, alternative data solutions, uh, as well as uh, cross-border uh, executive advisory with a focus on Asia and the US markets. So we're, uh, we're here today to talk about the new frontier on Wall Street. Uh, and as mentioned, we'll cover some themes, some key themes such as uh, you know, taking unstructured data uh, and putting it into uh, structured, uh, a structured form to identify signals in the market, uh, looking at alternative data and uh, some of its unique attributes, uh, as well as a pretty heavy focus on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and frankly, some of the challenges with uh, implementation uh, on, on those topics. So alternative data has been around for uh, more than 10 years. And uh, as was mentioned earlier in the conference, in the last five years, uh, frankly, with advances in technology, uh, we've seen hundreds of players enter the market. I think um, one presentation referenced 400. I think the number I've seen is, is probably closer to 1,000. So there's, there's a, lot, a lot of new players entering the market and a tremendous amount of opportunity uh, as a result. So what is alternative data? So alternative data, uh, you know, for those of you that may not know at this point, um, can be very, very broadly defined as uh, information that's not coming from the companies with which we want to invest in. So what are some examples of that? Examples are satellite imagery, uh, heat maps, uh, credit card purchase information, uh, and frankly, uh, WeChat, social media. So there'd be some examples. Now, within, within those realm of examples, you have um, the satellite imagery, for instance. We can count cars in parking lots at retailers. Right? This is a popular example. Um, and basically, you can count those cars on a daily basis, so it's real-time information. It's unbiased information. It's not coming from the companies themselves. No messages can be managed, so to speak. Um, and frankly, you can count those cars across the whole U.S. or across uh, you know, other, other countries as well. And what that will do is it will allow analysts to look at that and basically correlate that to near-term company performance. Another way alternative data can, can be used is even within the companies themselves. Frankly, if you wanted to gauge your own uh, internal marketing campaigns, you could also determine how that impact is, is happening on a more real-time basis versus waiting, uh, waiting for hindsight. So alternative data is not a replacement for traditional sources. Uh, you still have all, all the uh, traditional data out there that you would use, whether it's you know, obviously pricing data, benchmark data, people data, and something near and dear to my heart, uh, fundamental data. Everything, everything we, we've always used historically is still incredibly important, but alternative data coming on the scene now uh, can frankly become a real driver towards, towards understanding, um, understanding the, uh, the overall health of a company and where it's going. For instance, um, when you, uh, sort of like what VDOC had mentioned, you know, when companies publish their quarterly results every three months, you're really looking at hindsight. What I like about alternative data is, is that, well, first of all, it's unbiased, it's not coming from the companies, but it's also real time in nature. So you really can get the kind of um, you know, view day, day by day to determine where, where things are going with a, with a company or an industry, frankly. Um, so if asset managers have the time to invest on how to understand alternative data and its usefulness, I think that that's where everyone needs to play in order to have a competitive edge. So without further ado, I want to, I want to um, make an attempt at introducing each one of our panelists. So uh, to my left here, I have Sean, Sean Cochran, uh, CT, CI, TIC Securities, CLSA Global Head of Research. So Sean became the Group Head of Research in April 2019. In the preceding three years, having been appointed the Global Head of Thematic Research, he coordinated with CLSA analysts globally to identify transformational themes that would have long-term, that would drive long-term returns. Prior to this, he was based in Korea, where he led the global, global research team from 2007 to 2014. Before taking on the broader country head role, Sean joined CLSA in 2005 from Accenture, 
where he was a business strategy consultant heading up shareholder value analysis for North Asia Financials. We have Ra uh, Raphael Duendi, uh, Paris One, Sorbonne University, professor and visionary. Raphael is a French mathematician and economist specializing in data science, financial mathematics, and chaos theory at the University of Paris. He formerly held the Frere Chair of Quantitative Finance at Stony Brook University and was academic director of the French Laboratory of Excellence on Financial Regulation. He earned his PhD in Hamiltonian Dynamics and has more than 20 years of experience in the financial industry. He has particular interest in researching portfolio risks in which he has developed powerful, nonlinear statistical and data science models, as well as macroeconomics and systemic risk. He founded tech firms Risk Data, Risk Management for the Buy Side, and Data Core, Quantitative Portfolio ETFs, and is Chief Science Officer of Matrix, uh, AI for the Buy Side. Raphael is a member of the Praxis Club, a New York based think tank advising the French government on its economic policy and sits on the Board of Investment Committee of Friends of IHES, which is really the French brother of Princeton IAS. He's an alumni of École Normale Supérieure in Paris and was awarded the gold medal at the International Mathematic Olympiads. I definitely have to read this. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, uh, so next we have uh, uh, Sorry. Next we have Jen Wang, uh, Gom Finance, Chief Advisor, Robo-Advisor, and Investments. Jen is a distinguished scientist of financial artificial intelligence in a number of domestic and foreign listed companies. Chinhua University alumni tutor, uh, Chinhua PBCSF, uh, Xi Jing education lecturer, China Banking Association FinTech AI specialist, School of Management, Chinese Academy of Sciences lecturer in 2016, former equity and funds research principal in institutional wealth management, modeling and investment at Bloomberg LP in New York. Uh, Jen is also a former U.S. Uh, attorney. He holds a PhD in, uh, from Cornell University and a BS, actually triple degrees, from Tsinghua University. He focuses on machine learning and deep learning and finance with a focus on wealth management both on the 2C and 2B side. <clears throat> he performs strategic management to the top institutions in China. And last but not least, we have Johnson Poe, United Overseas Bank. Johnson has been practicing data science, uh, practicing data scientists for the past decade with experience spanning across finance, consulting, and government sectors. His current prior professional appointments include being Executive Director, Head of Enterprise Artificial Intelligence at UOB Group, Head of Data Science and Practice Lead at DBS Bank, Chief Data Scientist Asian Region at Booz Allen Hamilton, as well as Head of Data Science, Principal Data Scientist at Ministry of Defense Singapore. He also serves as an adjunct faculty member at Singapore Management University, uh, SMU. Johnson completed his, bachelor, his bachelor's degrees in pure mathematics Statistics and Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. He received his postgraduate degree in statistics at Yale University. So welcome, everyone. Okay, so I think, um, I guess I'm gonna start off with uh, Raphael. So many people look at machine learning as the solution to uh, all their problems. Although there are other people that feel as though it could be a bit of an illusion, that machine learning you know, can solve every problem. What sort of expectations should business leaders have uh, when implementing machine learning strategies? <coughs> the first thing is that uh, when there is a new tool like this that comes, people expect everything from that tool. And uh, in the they, they want every problem to be solved uh, by uh, machine learning. The same happened when computers appeared in the 60s, 70s. People thought that the computer would solve absolutely everything. It's a bit naive, of course. Uh, today, there is a, an enormous amount of money that is spent uh, for machine learning. I don't think it's a stupidity. I think it's, it deserves uh, all this research, and but 
uh, obviously it will not solve all the problems. Uh, so yeah, we we have great expectations on the one hand. We have a, a true revolution of data, the amount of data. I heard uh, earlier someone was saying uh, the world will be digital, no, the world will not be digital, the world is digital already. Uh, data uh, is an asset, uh, it has a price, a monitoring data has a price, a, a, a piece of data that is a raw piece of data uh, that doesn't have the same price as a piece of data that has been processed in a structure that is usable. <coughs> so it is uh, all about that. And from the macroeconomic point of view, uh, the, 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 we live in a world where the data has enormous value. And always remember that uh, a bit like the energy is what machines need to work, uh, all this uh, machine learning, etc., needs data. And precisely, it structures the data and it uses the data. It eats raw data, spits out some results, and in the meantime, generates more structured data. We were mentioning the fact that you know we had uh, among just to go into a bit technical things. Uh, we went from. <coughs> what we call SQL, that is uh, structured uh, query libraries, so the, the, the structured database, where a database is structured when you want, for instance, just to give you an example, you are talking of a bone, and a bone has a certain number of characteristics, a maturity, a level of coupon, who has issued it, etc., which market. Uh, and uh, you, we go now to unstructured, so no SQL database. So it's like, we can process, I'm giving you a piece of paper, I'm not telling you what there is in this piece of paper, and the computer will be able to structure it by itself. Uh, it looks like we can do absolutely everything, and in here, uh, again, we can let the computer do, find its way and structure it itself, most of the time, if you do it simply like this, without any guidance, the computer will do absolutely anything and nothing useful. You have to, it's not only teach the computer, it's, uh, people think of machine learning as you teach the machine, you give some test case, etc., so that the machine knows how to solve a problem. That works in a very close environment, when you want a machine who plays chess, who plays Go, uh, that will work. But when you want a machine who drives a car in a real environment, who will trade, who will analyze the creditworthiness of the borrower or thing like this, it's much more difficult because it's real environment. And it's all about, uh, basically, what people forget is that the problem of decision making which is the ultimate goal of all the data science and all artificial intelligence. The problem of decision making is a problem of dealing with exceptions. Dealing with the bulk of the problem, this is easy. We can always see the effect in the world. The problem is, what is that little sign that tells us everything? I was trying to, to, to remember, it. I'm sure that I'm, I'm apologizing for my lack of knowledge of uh, Chinese philosophy, but I am sure that we have the Chinese equivalent of what we say in French, le je ne sais quoi, le presque rien, the, that little thing, that almost nothing, uh, that in fact tells it all. You speak with somebody and uh, everything looks nice and at, at some point for a second, the mask opens and we see the real face behind the mask. And then that's what you want to see. And so it's all about that. And uh, that's where, in fact, we absolutely need um, a cooperation. Machine can help humans, but machine will not work without humans. And for a very simple reason, and I will uh, I'll say that, but for a very simple reason, humans have compared to machines, even if you teach machines for 
with thousands, with millions of cases, this is very shallow, this is very small compared to the billions and billions and billions of cases that we have seen in our life, that we have been taught by our parents, our grandparents, and even more so that we are the results ourselves of billions of years of evolution. So our brain is structured through billions of years of evolution. And this is, so the experience to deal with those exceptions, those very rare events uh, that we are structured for, it would take billions of years to build a computer that would be able to do so. And because we don't have that time, we have to teach the machine to put the machine in the right framework. And that's how it works to make machine learning actually efficient. Okay. Thank you, Raphael. So Jen, a similar question. Um, could you please share your perspective on, on how business leaders, like I said, are starting to look at machine learning to solve all their problems. Um, but from a different perspective, can you give us guidance on how to determine when to use machine learning strategies and what other strategies may be best implemented? Sure. Uh, thanks to my fellow speaker for sharing his thoughts on like uh, the background of the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I want to say, actually, nowadays, machine learning techniques have been used everywhere in every occasion. Um, it's kind of like, to me, machine learning is a hammer. And uh, once you get a hammer, that you see everything as a nail. And you want to use a hammer <laughs> on every nail. Um, it, it has been already used, in my personal opinion. Um, uh, Recently, there was a very hot debate in Nature, the journal, uh, about predicting earthquake. Uh, one professor arguing with uh, three Harvard scientists plus one Google scientist, because the Harvard uh, Google scientists uh, were trying to predict an uh, earthquake. And the professor on the other side actually argues there's data, data leakage. And, and the, the machine learning technique, uh, actually the deep learning technique used, actually only achieved similar results, or if not better, uh, than the traditional machine learning techniques, a very simple one like SVM. Uh, so that actually raises questions about like, you know, when we really should use machine learning techniques, especially those complex neural nets. Um, I think, okay, I think, you know, uh, academically, there's one famous theorem called no free lunch theorem in machine learning, which says, uh, I mean, it has different, you know, uh, formats, but it basically says you should design your algorithm based on specific task, based on the specific problems that you want to solve. You cannot, or you can never, at least based on current technologies, you cannot, you can never build a, like a universal algorithm that solves all problems beautifully. Uh, so that's actually the, the short answer. So you get a based on specific question, and you get to know it pretty well before you can design a specific framework and all to solve it. And that's from the academic perspective. From more industrial perspective, um, once you want to implement any machine learning algorithm, uh, you actually you, you need to know how the data is generated. You need to know how the workflow, you need to know the process pretty well. And so that you can know, you know, what is the key factor in this process? What, what, what can be solved using machine learning techniques? Um, working out. Um, so that actually determines what can be a really good machine learning mechanism. Okay. Uh, and, and also domain knowledge. Okay. So in summary, I will put it that way. In summary, domain knowledge in the long term will be a key factor to be a good machine learning technique. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jen. So Johnson, 
Uh, what would you say are some of the technical and organizational challenges in implementing machine learning within the banking environment? Oh, thanks for the question. So um, allow me to actually look at this question from the perspective of three areas. So uh, I think regardless of whichever context you're talking about, we, we're always focusing on the um, concepts such as the people, the technology, as well as the process. So if you're asking me about the challenges in, in relation to machine learning, uh, we've got to this three perspective. Uh, what I'd like to focus my attention really closely on the technology, right? So as it, equally important to the function of data is really the enablers, right, of how you want to practice machine learning uh, to uh, leveraging on large data sets. So technology in this case plays an equally important role. So we've got the technology uh, of course, it's really important to be able to uh, set up the right, the right uh, pipeline that allows us to actually implement machine learning that actually augments a human intuition. In other words, the machine learning capabilities uh, should not be static, but they should have a continuous learning capability. And in order to facilitate that continuous learning capability, um, a sound as well as robust technology platform is extremely relevant when it comes to allowing us to actually implement this process. So what I mean by the technology or the perhaps the, what makes up this technology that, 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 that um, I'm mentioning right here? Four basic things. First of all, of course, we need to have data. And with the advent of big data, the advent of alternative data, I think, um, I think this is pretty much a, 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 a well-defined concept for us. Uh, and at the same time, we have also a lot of uh, a large, larger volume of data that we're dealing with on a day-in-day -day basis. Uh, and I think in terms of having data, I don't think that's a big challenge. But the ability to handle big data will be a challenge, right? Storage as well as compute capability, right, is where the challenge comes in. So uh, I think previously, before the event of big data, we always have, we are always, uh, we have this uh, challenge of not having sufficient data. Uh, that's the reason why there's a lot of statistical implementations uh, that will be relevant. But now that we have access to large data, right, Having the ability to store as well as manage large data sets uh, is one of our, of course, one of the key challenges for technology. Uh, the second component is really the platform, right? We really need a platform that allows us um, to to uh, basically run our compu computing process, right? So I think this is where big data platforms will be extremely relevant. Ability to be able to set that up is equally challenging as well. Uh, the third factor is really that of the uh, tools. Right. As important as data, we need the, uh, the tools that helps us uh, perform the programming as well as, uh, and, uh, as well as the development of analytic algorithms as well as AI and machine learning capabilities. Right. So this is where uh, the ability to be able to integrate right, a, suite of, uh, a suite of machine learning uh, programming capabilities will be extremely handy as well. And last but not least, of course, is the analytics as well as the, develop the algorithms we need in order to facilitate this process. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a brain of the entire process. So uh, again, machine learning, as was mentioned earlier, has uh, some of the inherent challenges as well. Uh, as, 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 uh, as was discussed earlier, there's a need for both domain expertise, deep domain expertise, as well as uh, technical know-how, as well as programming capability to be able to deliver the, um, the, um, the promise of machine learning. So I guess, I guess these four factors together really really actually uh, brings together the challenge that we typically face when it comes to the technology component uh, of machine learning. Now let's move on to the other component is process. I think uh, uh, Wang Zhen mentioned very appropriately as well earlier that in order to actually deliver an effective machine learning algorithm or product, uh, as well as a machine, as well as AI capability, we need to be uh, very familiar as well as be very conversant with the process that allows us to develop an actual continuous learning model. Right, so this is where uh, knowledge of the, uh, the different process and different phases in machine learning is equally important as well. So knowledge of how to do perform um, business business case as well as scoping, right? Scoping of the business case, knowledge on data wrangling, right? Data processing, right? Data engineering, solution architecture, right? Data science, ability of build, build the algorithm algorithms themselves. Uh, as well as, uh, I think there's uh, recently a new field as well, it's what we call machine learning engineering, right? That translates the data science algorithms into the production environment uh, will, be, um, will be something that will be critical in determining whether the entire machine learning pipeline is successful or not. 
So I guess, uh, I guess knowledge of sources is, uh, is one of the challenges that we hope to be able to, uh, to create more awareness about, as well as to be able to drive it, drive the, uh, the uh, context to the entire organization. Uh, last but not least is this notion of uh, people, right? Uh, as, as you can see, there are multiple processes involved in uh, implementing an effective data science algorithm. Same thing as well, um, we need different professionals. Now, we need different people to play their roles in making sure that this pipeline is effective. Right, so this is where uh, this is where I think the um, the success of the entire machine learning machine learning capability should not just rest on the data scientists alone. Right, different people, right, different um, different professions actually plays a, an equally critical role in this in this entire pipeline. For example, with machine learning engineers, solution architect, data engineers, even the business owner and product owner themselves. Right, will offer an extremely important, but play an extremely important role in providing the domain expertise in helping us in helping data scientists accelerate the process of building an, uh, building an effective model. So I, I think with regard to the challenges that that, uh, that I see in our current context, I think it really revolves this three notion around these three notions of uh, people, technology, as well as the process. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Excellent points. Hey, Sean. So uh, what? What is the degree to which the CLSA's clients are familiar with in applying alternative data in Asia today? Okay, so um, I, I think I'll kick off with an important distinction that's very apparent from this panel, which is we need to make a distinction in my mind between artificial intelligence and alternative data. We would argue that alternative data can feed uh, the expertise uh, in this room to uh, deliver real-world outcomes and hopefully that's a return on your uh, assets. If we then say the bulk of this discussion is around AI, then how are our clients thinking about AI and how is CLSA thinking about AI? First I'd like to start with a question to the audience, which is who here feels that they can go blow for blow and keep up with the conversation with a PhD in data science or uh, computer science? Is, is there anyone in this room that feels comfortable with that? Right, so uh, and that, to me, is exactly what I have to do on a daily basis, is um, world-class experts like this understand a new world that is being built that we all have to try and um, implement and understand. And I sit at that nexus between my clients who are trying to understand uh, how to apply this. And the reality is some of the greatest minds in the world have been doing this for a long time. And they're making great returns in some instances. And so what we are trying to do with our own clients is help them on that journey to understand the process. And the key thing in our mind is to understand that we were talking earlier, a number of the panelists talked about it's a very specific task. Teach an algorithm to extract a return from a specific class of asset on a specific time horizon. What we will typically find from our perspective is that um, AI today is very sophisticated and capable of making a return on a short time horizon. And that's incredibly powerful in that if you can compound on a shorter time horizon, you'll generate wealth more quickly. So we understand why there's, uh, one of the panelists mentioned there's an enormous amount of money going into this industry, and it makes sense, and we completely agree. But when you think about the traditional institutional investment community and how they interact with Wall Street that I on this panel probably uh, most represents, uh, the simple reality is that we have data sets that we provide to our clients that we have no clue what they do with them. And those that extract the greatest value are more likely to pay us more money for those data sets and in fact pay us more for exclusivity or a reduced availability of that data set to the institutional community. We then have uh, data sets that are more available to our client base and we have data sets that we use in our own proprietary trading in that our entire trading desk has moved to more algorithmic trading which is a subset of this discipline uh, and less uh, cash flow based. So I think the simple reality is the data scientists are extremely uh, advanced in the pursuit of AI for very specific return-based goals. How we apply this to the traditional investment industry is completely unanswered in my mind. And one of the most interesting questions is, how do you apply this in medium and long-term questions? Because I would argue that for those of you that are seeking to apply AI, but feel you don't understand it and don't have a deep infrastructure in your organization, I would forget anything that's on a microsecond or a second or a daily basis, that market is done. So the opportunity in our mind for those that are new to this space is how do I think about this in reinforcing the skills we already have in medium and long-term thinking where there's less 
uh, competition and less clear answers as to how to approach it. Thanks, Sean. So, Jen, uh, can you talk to some of the differences in the approach between how the United States leverages AI versus how China would best leverage it? Um, for example, in order to build a fintech product in China, is it, sim is it possible to simply you know, replicate a successful US-centric product um, and expect similar results in China? Okay. Uh, the short answer is no. Or at least, I don't think so, personally. And let me elaborate a little bit more. Uh, so there are several aspects that are significantly different uh, in US and in China. So first of all, I'll say the markets are different. I mean, I'll focus on the financial market because uh, I work in this field. Uh, the financial market, as you can see in the US, you know, the Dow Jones goes higher and higher, and uh, China Asia is mm, no comment. Uh, and, and passive investing as a well-known strategy uh, works pretty well in the US, but not in China, uh, at least now. Uh, so the markets are different, first of all. And second, Regulation-wise, uh, is pretty different. Uh, I mean, as we know, the U.S. is kind of registration-wise, you know, and, and it's more transparent. Uh, China is, you know, more dynamic, fast-changing regulation uh, environment. I would put it that way. And also, third, thirdly, uh, the competitor, the the, the the market participants are different. What I mean by that is, uh, in US, like say in the financial industry, uh, most of the market participants are institutions. But in China, uh, there are a lot of individual investors. So you gotta, you gotta design your own artificial intelligence product catering to those retail investors instead of uh, the financial institutions. I mean, or or in addition to, I'll put it that way. Uh, more uh, fourth play, I would say competitor differ as well. So in US, you it's more like tech companies compete with tech companies and financial institutions compete with traditional financial institutions. Um, but in China, the competition is often you know cross borders. You can often see, like you know, uh, like a tech company doing financial services in China, which is pretty common. And mm -hmm. the last play, but not least, but not the least, data differs a lot in both countries. Uh, so say, I mean, not only alternative data, but also like data sources, and also how to use the data, how to gather the get, get the data. So say. Uh, in China, there's a complete chain or service chain of like, you know, human labeling a lot of data to train the machines. And, 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 and people sometimes call those people like machine trainer, right? I mean, so all those facts sum up, you know, they all differ in US and China. So that actually add up to my previous short answer. Uh, I don't think copying a US successful or US centric AI product directed to China will gain like a dramatic success. Okay. Thanks, Jen. So Rafael, uh, when evaluating machine learning capabilities, can you describe the differences between how a human brain um, works versus how the machine brain would function? And yeah. what can each expect from the other? Yeah, I think keeping the perspective uh, I remember my father was joking, my father was a great mathematician, he was joking what if the computer that is the most powerful computer produced in very, very uh, high quantities with uh, low level labor force. And of course it's a human brain. Uh, just to give you figures, the human brain is made of approximately a billion or two billion neurons each of them having uh, one to several thousands of synapses, that is connection between neurons. So we are talking of trillions of synapses. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the speed at which they react 
is of the order of the millisecond. When you compare to the nanosecond, uh, we are in gigahertz uh, for the uh, for the silicon com computers. So, uh, if you look at the number of operations, if you consider a connection uh, between neurons as like a, a cycle, an operation, an elementary operation, we are in both cases um, on the order of, uh, if you take a GPU, for example, you have about a thousand uh, units, we are in both cases on the order of a trillion. So the computing capacity of the uh, computer today is comparable. The structure is completely different. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I come back to this idea that you know we are extremely trained compared to a, to, a, to a physical computer. We are extremely trained. So there is something that uh, just to to alleviate what you were saying about the difference between uh, different grounds. I just see U.S. as a ground, China as a different ground, um, <coughs> and that is true. Uh, in fact, if you think. If you want to, to understand data science, you can, even if you are not a mathematician, uh, I'm sure a lot of people here, uh, you know, are not highly trained in math, and yet you can still keep your common sense if you observe your own brain and look at how we make a decision out of the picture that we see. When we look at things, when we look at people, what is the first thing you see? We don't take, you know, an image like, you know, a sequence of pixels, you know, with intensity of light. We do a lot of pre-processing. Uh, when I see a picture, you know, when I read a text uh, like this, in fact, what happens? We first identify that an image has contours. Then we see that the contours, in fact, are shaped and correspond to some alphabet that we have pre-canned in here. And this is interesting, because I don't speak Chinese, I, I've seen lots of Chinese characters, but when I see a Chinese character, I see it is a Chinese character, of course, my brain is trained to that, but it's not able to read it. It's not able to identify that this is a one, this is a two, or whatever. Um, but of course, if I see uh, an English letter, I see it immediately, it's pre in my, in my brain. For your case, it's different because if you see a Chinese character, you will identify it. It goes into your mm. internal dictionary. Uh, so we are pre-trained for that. And then we can see letters. We can see whether the letters are making sense and making a word. We can see whether the words are making sense and make a text, and whether the text makes a meaning. Mm. So there is a lot of layers that apply to analyze an image. Mm. Those layers, in our case, have been built through, that's why it's all this evolution process. We have been taught when we were kids, we have been uh, uh, trained, etc. Uh, so the communication between humans and machine is to precisely uh, help the machine work. What we do is feature extraction. This is a language we use and uh, help the machine, you know, on what to analyze. So that what uh, Jean, was, uh, Jean was saying is that uh, the, the, if you, the feature that you need to analyze uh, the US market, like technical analysis, are different from those that you would use to analyze the Chinese market uh, because of the structure, etc. And here you need to expect, you need people who have spent a lot of time in it to know which features, etc. I just want to end with one warning, uh, because I've seen that in large banks. Uh, there is a gap of competence. The hiring process, I've seen people making enormous mistakes in hiring, uh, because uh, the structure of the human resource departments, etc., who hire uh, all those guys, they have the task to build a team of machine learning, and they make their own hiring because someone has the right keywords on their CV, but they haven't learned it. And some other people have truly uh, well-trained competencies, etc., and don't find a job simply because they don't fit. And that is simply due to the fact that the, the hiring process, so if you are in the position of, uh, you know, being a, an institution, take care of your hiring process, make sure that uh, the people who hire uh, those machine learners, those 
data scientists, etc., are people who know what they are doing, uh, who has some training on that, uh, on this uh, new science is very, very important because I've seen so many mistakes. Uh, thanks a lot, Raphael. Some important points there. Uh, teaching a machine context is really a key theme out of there. That's always very, very challenging. And uh, there's a, actually a very popular and sort of famous uh, uh, article on Amazon where they had, they implemented machine learning for the hiring process for uh, software engineers and it turned out to be a massive failure after about a year. Um, but we don't have time for me to get into that now, but, but the, that, that's an interesting read as well. Um, Johnson, uh, what are some of the key enablers for implementing end-to-end -end, an end-to-end -end, uh, AI-driven pipeline? All right, so I, I would like to use the, uh, the, uh, the same concept that I mentioned earlier. So basically, whenever I mentioned for challenges, right, the key enablers, uh, for the key enablers, I think a similar context applies as well. So I think technology actually plays a very important role in enabling the development of what we call an end-to-end -end data science pipeline, where right? all the way from uh, the start where you actually store data up to the context where you process them, and finally analyzing them and subsequently uh, visualizing them in a, in a context of a, a software application. So these are all, and in order to actually be able to deliver that entire pipeline, uh, technology plays an extremely important role. So this is where the ability to be able to handle large data sets, right, big data, ability to be able to build a platform that allows us to uh, collaborate, right, so this is one important factor, allows data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers as well to collaborate, as well as to uh, 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 enable reproducible research, right, so that, that platform is extremely important. And uh, thirdly, a suite of tools, right, on top of platform, on top of the infrastructure, we need to have the programming environment, as well as the um, as well as the capability to to what we call curate right curate the artifacts in relation to the practice of data science. Those will enable that process as well. And last but not least, um, the um, the uh, the relevance of what we call uh, an end to end to end data science framework that captures the different phases as well as processes uh, that's relevant to the implementation of the final result. Uh, will be one of the key enablers as well. Um, last but not least, I would actually like to add up to the point that I think uh, cloud computing actually plays an, uh, an, an important role, an interesting role in enabling the uh, scalability of machine learning, right? Precisely because, first of all, right, cloud, if the cloud enable us to scale our resources in terms of infrastructure, computing capability, as well as uh, uh, storage capability. And secondly, the cloud allows us to implement the entire data science pipeline end to end within the same environment. And thirdly, uh, cloud also enables us, uh, for those of you who do not have, for those of us, or perhaps organizations who do not have, and a real-time capability to stream in data, to perform actually real-time streaming when it comes to real-time analysis. And last but not least, right, the um, cloud also offers us a suite of uh, open source machine learning uh, libraries, capabilities, uh, as well as services that allows you to actually uh, 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 leapfrog your implementation. Right, you don't have to design your analytics algorithm from scratch. There are a lot of uh, open source packages and libraries uh, that are actually uh, pre pre packaged as a service that are offered on cloud computing services as well. Okay, thank you, Johnson. So we have uh, a little bit of time left, and uh, Sean, I think uh, let's try to get one more question. Um, what type of client investment strategies is alternative data most applicable to in its current form? So that just gets back to what I was talking about earlier, which is that um, when we look at al alternate data, um, the way it's currently being used is typically from shorter term uh, return structures from the clients that we work with. One of the things that's particularly interesting is I was sitting down with a data scientist from City this morning actually, and we were looking at what are the signals that we can extract from various um, techniques that are known to the industry, whether it be looking at traffic signals, you can look at geospatial signals, whatever it may be. But let's come up with an example. For example, you can look at uh, property transactions, uh, you can look at the price of the buildings, you can look at where a given um, uh, company has their locations. So maybe you want to compare one um, chain of stores against another chain of stores, and you can look at what's the implied rental yield uh, of the buildings that they're in relative to the implied foot traffic from something like a um, the, uh, the cars in the uh, car parks, for example, which is less relevant to Asia, but I'm just uh, trying to put a basic concept together, which is 
To me, the value in alternative data is not the data itself. What the industry has done in our view is it's gotten itself into a rhythm of going out and asking a series of questions and then selling a series of answers um, when, as it relates to research rather than algorithmic trading or trying to use AI to, to run a uh, process. So it's selling these answers and then the industry is trying to figure out how to make extract value from that. And it's eventually going to commoditize because we talked about thousands of players, because we talk, also talked about um, libraries of tools that everyone can apply. So in the long run, everyone will be able to do this. So the real value is not actually in the answers you can buy, but in the questions you ask, and how you take these tools and ask more interesting questions to come up with, come up with more valuable insights. Great, thank you, it's very helpful. Okay, well I think that concludes our panel. Um, Thank you all for uh, being here today. Appreciate it.